Hello everyone, I'm so excited to come your way today. A number of people have contacted me regarding the possibility of answering questions or taking you guys through in other units such as microbiology, histopathology, biochemistry, and immunology. I have given that a thought and I decided to collaborate with some friends and colleagues here who are already working in the UK to help to address any possible questions that can be asked either in histopathology, immunology, microbiology, or biochemistry. The whole idea is to help you guys to do well during your interview because you need the required knowledge to be able to do well and excel in that interview and of course the overall get the job as a biomedical scientist. Therefore, I hope as you listen that you are going to enjoy it. After listening, please feel free to put any comments of any question that you have regarding the video and I'm more than happy to answer or get that colleague to answer, answer the question, okay? Hello guys, welcome on board. Uh, we are going to be looking at, uh, we are going to be discussing an important question in biochemistry. For those of you that will be uh, applying for job in the department of bi biochemistry as biomedical scientist so during your interview we are going to see a very important question that usually come up in this video so this in this question is about um how to validate potassium in most cases in most of the interviews based on my experience uh, uh, in my most of the interviews i have attended when i was uh, searching for job one of the questions that keeps reoccurring is this question of how do you validate high potassium results they might ask you they might ask the question this way said you finish running a sample and the potassium result is 7.5 or 6.5 they will give you any value and ask you what will you do as a biomedical scientist so this is a very technical question and uh, it's very important to address it with caution and appropriately so the interview is trying to understand your ability to to use your technical knowledge and clinical knowledge to actually uh, uh, to apply those knowledges those, those knowledge when you are trying to validate your results or when you're trying to list your results so it's very important that you apply them in this situation now yes a lot of factors affect your potassium results but they have they want, they want to they want to make sure you understand the fact that it could affect some of your lab results and how to rule out uh, the results that are affected by these factors so for potassium a, a bit about potassium i know most of us know about potassium but i have to say a little bit about it potassium is one of the electrolytes that usually they usually analyze in the laboratory when they request for an electrolyte what they call user needs so when they request for user needs usually try and create me Electrolyte is one of those, uh, 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 that's one of those electrolytes that have been analyzed. So, um, potassium is very important because it plays a role in the muscle contraction and maintaining of uh, our our heartbeat and our blood pressure. So, high potassium is really uh, dangerous, which is hyperkalemia and low potassium. Hypokalemia is also very dangerous. So, either of them. Uh, is very dangerous so in this question you've seen what the the question so what you should we're going to be struggling is one high potassium on one hand and two what do i do on the other hand no influence that is above your reference range because yeah this value is above reference range of if not all laboratories my own lab is about 2.5 to 2, 2 to 5.5 for there about 2 to 5.5 why some lab will have 2 to 2.5 to 5.5 so this this result is usually above your reference range of all, if not all the laboratories, so they're expecting you to act as a biomedical scientist. So, for you to act, you need to understand what affect potassium. Number one of the factor that affect potassium is how the sample was collected. Number two, the specimen container that was used to collect the sample. Number three, is uh, the the storage. What happens? Was the sample separated after after collection, or was it stored to whole blood overnight before sending to the laboratory? Now let me give you an, a, a, an overview of what happens. It creates a kind of picture. In the in the in the NHS laboratories, samples are not collected in the lab, unlike in some countries where they collect samples in the lab. So samples are collected um, by phlebotomists, which are either in the GPs or in the wards or in the in the laboratory phlebotomy proper, and they are sent into where they call specimen reception, where samples are processed, 
So your, your samples are booked in and processed. In this case, uh, spawn in the centrifuge, and they are sent into the analyzer. So as a biomedical scientist, you're looking at these results coming in from coming in from through the analyzer to your through your data manager, and they uh, are moving into the limbs. It can be wind path, it can be lab where it can be lab center, it can be tell, it can be anything, it can be any of your uh, lab information management system. So you have to look at this resource. You are just looking at the results. You don't know what happened during the collection. Apparently, analytical stages doesn't concern you because you don't know what happened. But it will concern you when you want to validate your results. You have to take into consideration what happened. So, like I said, most of these um, factors that affect potassium results, that, 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 that give rise to a high potassium result, is pre analytical issues. So, but you have to address it in the lab. Now, this, your result is 7.5 or 6.5. This is high. This is high, guys. You don't have to release that result without looking at what, or without making some investigation. So, the first thing you are going to do is to find out the kind of tube that we used to collect the sample. Was it the right tube? Was it the wrong tube? So, in this case, one of the EDT, or one of the anticoagulants that affect potassium results in clinical chemistry laboratory is the sample that are collected using a, using a tripotassium EDT, like can, can, according to the name, tripotassium, it also has potassium. So that means it will firstly increase the value of a potassium result in your sample. So how to know that is to check the calcium result. If the sample was booked in for calcium, then you just check the result of the calcium. Of course, if the calcium is less than one or very low, less than, in most cases, from my experience, experience I have seen it usually less than 0.2 but in some i think i've seen a situation where i saw that calcium i think about uh, uh, 0.8 or 0.9 but in majority of them i have seen it less than 0.2 so this result means that actually they, the, that edta which is an anticoagulant had chelated or mopped up calcium which adds in blood coagulation or blood clotting and leaving that calcium pushing that calcium into a negative balance thereby increasing the potassium level because of the potassium that is already contained in that EDTA. So that makes it easier for you. You look at it, you cannot release that potassium. You don't have to call anyone. If concluded, it's a contaminated sample, contaminated with EDTA. Then you have to delete or knock off your potassium results. Also, if the patient has calcium requested for the test or if someone has calcium requested, you have to knock off calcium. Then you have to knock off magnesium. Also, it will be very, very low. It will not be real. It will be. It will be really a very low magnesium, not compatible with life. Then when you knock off magnesium, you have to knock off your alkaline phosphate or ALP result. You have to knock it off because it will be really low. Then you have to knock off iron. If the sample has iron requested as an investigation or iron studies, or we'll call iron studies, they have to knock off those results. So when you knock off these results, you put a comment that this result was knocked off or we are deleted or we are uh, uh, made not available because the sample was contaminated with ETA. So that if the clinician or whoever that sent the, the request is looking at the result, they say, okay, why I'm not seeing this result is because this sample is not suitable for this to be run, uh, for this parameter to be tested on. So, if they so need it, they will request, they will make another request, and at this time, they will be, they will be cautious enough to correct the right sample. That is one way to address this question. Then, if you've investigated and you find that your calcium is okay, like two point something, it's within your normal range, there's no cause for alarm. Calcium is okay, it's within, it's normal, it doesn't show that calcium has been mopped up. Then, you have to investigate again. What happened after sample collection? They now check the age of the sample. The request forms of every sample comes with the date and time sample was collected. So you have to pull out this request form of this sample. In most cases, they are scanned in into the card viewer. You can open your card viewer if you have one and check and enter the um, lab number of that sample and check the card being scanned or form being scanned that was scanned in. They have to check the date the sample was collected. If the sample was collected a day or two days before or three days before it was analyzed, then automatically you will knock off potassium because it will be a false high potassium result. So what happens in this case is that potassium now leaks in from the intracellular cells to the extracellular uh, environment. So it will now leak out, the, the, it will leak out, it will ooze out from the red blood cells increasing its value in the plasma or in the serum as the case may be so you don't have to lose this result so you are going to knock off your potassium 
then when you knock it off you can now put not applicable or you can put any comment to show them that this is actually a delayed sample so the result is not suitable for potassium analysis so again if you have looked at your potassium your the sample um the sample age is the same day the sample was collected the same day you are running it and it was booked in the same day no nothing what nothing it collected it was collected and sent in and you, you analyzed it then you have to also make other investigation the next investigation i'm going to make is to know how the sample was collected now first of all you've looked at sample collection tube which is either eta or the right tube and you've established that this sample was collected with the right tube because the casion was still okay and you've investigated that this sample was collected was not a delayed sample then you've you've knocked off wrong tube you've knocked off um date of sample collection and how it was kept after, after collection if if the sample was collected and separated it's not a problem but it was collected and not separated like what happens in most um gps when they collect their sample they don't have centrifuge they don't have a laboratory they keep it until the next time the courier person will come for sample transportation they will give so if you've established that this sample wasn't uh, and a delayed sample and its tube was wasn't the wrong tube it was collected using the serum gel or the real the, or the right tube for the for that test then you have to go to the next stage of investigation the next stage is what how was the sample collected now in this case if it's a baby sample for example you know most of their samples are collected using a from the heel puncture and in this point in the process of collecting sample there is a lot of squeeze to get this blood so they will squeeze the, the heel to make sure that they get a lot of blood so in the process of squeezing they must have lysed these bleed cells so when they lysed these cells potassium will not ooze out from the intracellular compartment where it was uh where, where it's in high concentration and ooze that into the intracellular compartment which is the plasma or the serum as the case may be so if you've established for it to establish that you have to give a call to the world if it's coming from the world, you have to give a call to the world and say, sorry, I'm finished running your sample and the efficient sample from your world. And this is what I'm getting, this is the potassium result I'm getting. So how was the sample collected? They will tell you, all right, it was collected in the right way. Or they will say, sorry, uh, we, we, we did a, a, a squeeze and that, that may not be the right result. They will, they, will, they will always be sincere to tell you the truth. And they will tell you, in most cases you might ask them please have you did you run the blood gas by chance they say oh yeah they will check for you what the blood gas is so your blood your your the the, the plasma potassium or serum potassium shouldn't differ from the potassium in the blood gas so the both of them should be saying the same thing if your potassium uh, your serum potassium or plasma potassium is higher than what is in the blood gas that means something is wrong with what happened or the sample. It's either the wrong sample was sent to you or the collection was wrong or the sample was not properly stored after collection. So you have to establish this. If they, they, they accept that, okay, this sample is a baby we squeezed, then you have to ignore, you have to reject that sample and create integrity. You have to reject, you have to knock up potassium and, and put a comment that sample integrity was queried or sample was not properly collected. Then, if they so wish to make a decision using potassium, they will send a fresh sample, and in this case, they will collect it rightly. So, if you finish doing all these things, you finish making all this investigation, and you still find out that the sample was properly collected, the blood gas matches. If they if they did the blood gas and it matches with the real result, then you are good to release this result as a high potassium result. Then, you have to also understand your phoning limit of the laboratory. It, it, yeah, you, you, some 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 laboratories have phone limits that are higher than their reference range. Like yes, my laboratory, our most of our phone limits are higher than our reference ranges. So it's above the reference range doesn't mean it's a phone limit. So if your phone limit, if your reference range is say is two point five to five point five, for example, for potassium, and you your your phone limit is six point five. That means if you get a result that is 5.6, you shouldn't phone it because it's not within your phone limit. So that's not what your SOP says. So you have to follow your procedure. So you have to know what your phone limit is. But when you must have investigated and all the, the sample was collected with the right tube, not EDTA, the sample was not stored overnight without spinning, and the sample and there was no uh, heel squeeze or squeezing during the sample collection. In most cases, apart from children, apart from pediatric samples, to even 
um, elderly patients that have a very frail or, or tiny uh, uh, veins, for you to get the sample, they struggle, so they squeeze a lot. So it can affect the result. They will tell you this result, we struggle with it. You know that it's actually uh, going to have a high potential result. So when you must have established this 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 fact, and you are convinced that this sample doesn't have more, none, none of these factors have affected the sample pre in the pre analytical state, then you have to release it at the right potassium result. Provided that your quality control passed, your calibrator didn't fail, and every of your technical checks are okay in the lab, then you have to release the result. But if any of those factors affect the sample, either collected, either it's collected with a wrong tube, or it's collected and stored without spinning overnight or there's a squeeze during sample collection then potassium has to be knocked off the difference is that if it is collected using the wrong tube we have to knock off potassium knock off calcium knock off magnesium knock off alkaline phosphates and knock off iron and how do you establish if a sample was collected using the wrong uh, um, a sample container is by checking the result of your calcium it will be really low so you have to address you have to give them this point don't spare anyone go all the way give it to them and they will understand that you actually know what you are doing and how to address this technical uh, situation so it's very important you don't just run results and say oh i have seen a high potassium result and i'll release it you no know, if i if i'm running a test and i'm sitting on my system and then the results are coming through i see a potassium that is greater than 10. It doesn't bother me because I'm going to make my investigation. So I must find out what made it to be 10. In most cases, in most cases, experience has shown that most of these high potassium, firstly high potassium results are from GP samples because they don't have a laboratory. They have a system that moves the sample real time to the lab from their from their clinics. So they keep it um, in their fridge or whatever. And next day or next day or whenever the courier person gets to their to their, to their clinic, they pick the sample and they uh, sent to the laboratory so guys thanks so much for your time i believe that you are going to listen and uh, please do well to uh, uh, ask your questions or make your comments and uh, we'll take it off from there thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day